in their forest home, bonobos prefer to make love, not war. But where the forest gives way to open savanna, lives a monkey which at first glance seems extremely aggressive. Male and female savanna baboons live side by side. There is plenty of sexual tension and competition, and with their razor-sharp teeth, males can easily inflict fatal injuries. Despite this aggression, as often as once an hour, a male meets up with another male and instead of fighting, they partake in a homosexual greeting ritual. Some of these males will form stable partnerships or alliances, while other meetings end as casually as they began. A male looking for a partner appears to take a great risk exposing his private parts to another male. In behavior known as diddling, he puts the means to his reproductive success in the hands of another male. But the risk can be worth it, because while bonobo sex is promiscuous, these baboon partnerships can last several years. The significance of a close friend becomes clear when a rival appears. <laughs> Two can face up to one, and though the more powerful rival tries to impose himself, an uneasy peace is maintained. While male baboons unite against hostile forces in partnerships that have been known to last up to six years, out in the open ocean, some males become partners for life. It has long been accepted that dolphins are playful, physical, affectionate creatures. They're also very sexual. These two male bottlenose may well have been together since they were young. When one partner rests, the other watches out for predators. They nurse each other when wounded and travel together in search of females. They will even share the same female. But the male-female bond is temporary. It is the male-male bond which lasts. Two male couples often meet up to form a foursome. If a dolphin dies, his widowed partner may search in vain for another single male. Sometimes the widower is welcomed by the male couple which were his part-time companions and they form a threesome. But a widower has never been known to break an already existing male pair bond. In the Bahamas, bottlenose share the warm waters with spotted dolphins. Equally sensual and sexual, the spotted dolphins have a similar social setup. Denise Herzing has been tracking these two communities for 16 years and has been able to study male-male and female-female couples. In dolphins, both males and females have what is known as a genital slit, and same-sex partners stimulate this slit with their beak or rostrum. There's a behavior called beak genital propulsion, where they seem to push each other. It's probably just a form of stimulation along in the water with one dolphin's uh, rostrum in the other dolphin's genital, male-male and female-female. So why are same-sex pair bonds so strong? If same-sex behavior has the function of, uh, of pleasure or social bonding, then what you've got is a mechanism, in addition to other mechanisms, that glue the society together. Society, in this case, would seem to include more than just one species, as a bottlenose male appears to consent to homosexual behavior with a group of spotted dolphins. Sometimes the interactions between these two species are aggressive. Other times they cooperate, babysitting or joining forces against sharks. But why should there be homosexual behavior between two different species? 
Perhaps the same bonding which works within a group works across species which cooperate with each other. But as with so many questions in this area, research is in its infancy, and scientists are still searching for the answers. In lion society, bonds between females can also last for life. But lionesses cooperate for different reasons than dolphins. Sisters or half-sisters come together to help rear their young. Lionesses are extremely affectionate towards one another, but only occasionally do they engage in same-sex mounting. Some researchers argue that same-sex partners which come together to rear young should be considered homosexual, whether or not they actually have sex, in the same way that a male-female parenting arrangement would be considered heterosexual. These cubs have a playful family life, even though they rarely see their father. If this lion sisterhood tells us anything, it is that members of the same sex working together can make great parents. The traditional model of one male and one female bringing up a family together is the exception in the animal kingdom rather than the rule. But heterosexual parenting does occur and is most commonly found in birds. But even in birds, there are exceptions. Male greylag geese form male-male pair bonds, and when it's time to raise the young, they team up with a female to make a trio. These goslings have three parents, a male couple and a mother. On the same lake, some heterosexual couples are also found bringing up young. This fascinating social mix has allowed ornithologist Philippe Carouet to compare the parenting success of heterosexual couples versus the trios. The advantage for the trio is quite obvious. You have to look at the advantage for each individual within that group. Each bird has in effect three birds to look after its chicks, and thus a better defense against predators. Their chicks are much safer. Also, since the female is with two males, she has a higher social rank and a better chance of survival. The female also has more time to take care of the chicks and then seek food for herself. Besides keeping watch for predators and guarding their young, the two males defend their territory from other ganders, a role they seem to take extremely seriously. In this particular trio, one male is dominant over the other and spends more time away defending their territory. When he returns, he performs a triumph ceremony, both to the female and to the other male. So the group is very important. This male is very particular, because although he's dominant over the whole group, he forgets neither the female nor the male. The connection between the individuals is very strong. But in this situation, is one male playing the role of unpaid nanny, doing all the hard work for nothing, while the other is father of the chicks? In the trio we're following, the female only seems to mate with the dominant male. If a trio forms with two males of the same rank, there will be occasional fights. But in any case, as far as I know, two males do not mount each other. In these cases, both males mate with the female, and so both males will father some of the young. And the goslings do better with three parents. So by providing same-sex parents, nature seems to have found an arrangement where everyone benefits. At the end of the breeding season, when the business of rearing young is over, the female will break away from the happy threesome. In grey lake geese, it is the male-male pair bonds that persist and remain stable from year to year. But if nature has rules for same-sex parenting arrangements, we haven't yet found them. Goslings seem to benefit from same-sex parents, but for roseate terns, the benefits are far from obvious.